HMS Speedy was a British gunboat that sailed from York, which is Toronto now, to Newcastle, which was on Presque Isle Point at that time. This was October of 1804. It was carrying about 20 people who were planning to conduct a murder trial at Newcastle in the courthouse there. A terrible storm came up before they got to Newcastle. And the 20 souls on board and the ship were never seen again. Well, this was a terrible disaster for Upper Canada, <clears throat> especially <clears throat> for the town of York, which was less than a decade old at that time. And more than two centuries later, the final resting place of HMS Speedy remains a mystery. Now, my new book and uh, this presentation attempts to explain the historical events leading up to the loss of the Speedy, as well as the situation regarding the search for the remains of the Speedy that happened in the early 1990s. But then one might ask, why have I written this book at this time? Well, the answer is here. In the fall of 2018, I received a phone call. And a few hours later, this box of documents ended up on my table. These are the personal papers of Mr. Ed Burt. He was the professional diver who, in the early 1990s, conducted three years of underwater survey work out in Lake Ontario, looking for the remains of HMS Speedy. Now, Ed passed away, sadly, in the fall of 2017. And a year later, his family thought that, you know, that history guy in Brighton should have Ed's documents. We'd actually worked together for a couple of years on promotional issues, and they thought I could give Ed's story a, um, objective treatment. And as I looked at that box of documents, I knew my next book would be about the Speedy. So let's look at the events that led up to the loss of the Speedy. This happened in October of 1804. Um, the places I'm going to mention are highlighted here on the map with the dark arrows. There's the fur trading post on Lake Scugog, the town of York, which later would be Toronto. Fort George was a military base uh, at the mouth of the Niagara River. A little place called Oak Orchard Creek on the U.S. shore. Smith's Creek, which would later be Port Hope. And Newcastle, which was on Presque Isle Point at that time. And of course, I'm talking to you today from Brighton, which is right here, just a pleasant bike ride down into Presque Isle Provincial Park. And let's not forget Kingston. At that time, Kingston had a military base, a Point Frederick shipyards, and lots of merchants. So Kingston literally acted as the supply depot for all the activity that was happening across the lake. <clears throat> Now, in 1802, the fur trading post had been set up there on Lake Scugog. And by 1804, it was being managed by a pair of brothers, William and Moody Farewell. They would make trips up into the North Country, come back with lots of uh, furs in their canoes. When they were away, they left John Sharp, an ex-British soldier, in charge of the post. Now, his job was to guard the place and to trade with any of the Mississauga people in the area who came around with furs. In May of 1804, the Farewell brothers returned from one such trip and found John Sharp murdered. Well, they buried the body of their associate as best they could. And then the very next morning, they paddled south across Lake Scugog. Then they walked south across the Scugog carrying place to the lake shore around present day Oshawa. And when they got to the lake shore, they overheard a local settler named Elazir Lockwood describe how the night before he had overheard a young Mississauga man bragging to his buddies about how he had bashed in the head of a white trader. That young man's name was Agatonicut. And he was, in fact, very proud of what he had done. According to the customs of his people, he had gained restitution for his family in light of the death of his brother, Whistling Duck, a year before at the hands of a white settler. So at least at the Mississauga camp, there was no mystery about the death of John Sharp. Well, the Mississauga people had just established themselves in their traditional summer camp at the mouth of Annis Creek, which would later be Oshawa Creek, and they did extensive fishing there. Their chief, Wabakishiko, was very concerned at this turn of events. In fact, he feared for the safety of his people. He had to make a very tough choice. 
And he decided that Agatonica must be handed over to the authorities. So the next morning, he took his people to the shore and they launched their canoes and paddled towards York. The very next morning, Moody Farewell and Elizir Lockwood launched a canoe and also paddled towards York. Their objective was to report the murder of John Sharp to the authorities there. This sketch of York Harbor in 1802 shows the environment they approached. They would have seen the sand spits going all the way out to the west to what we call Toronto Islands today. Asbridge's Bay was at that time a very large marshy area. <clears throat> it was crossed with channels and full of areas called wild hay on this map. There were some portages at the east end, but Elizir and Moody would have continued on to the second portage and crossed directly into the waters of York Harbor where they could paddle right to the town of York. In the meantime, Wabakishiko had established his people in their traditional camp when they came to this area, right out on Gibraltar Point. And there they waited for the authorities to come and arrest Agatonica. <clears throat> Moody Farewell and Elizir Lockwood went straight to Parliament House, which you see here, and reported the murder of John Sharp. There were two men in this building that were very interested, Lieutenant Governor Peter Hunter and Chief Justice Henry Alcock. In fact, they were alarmed at this news. Of course, the first order of business was to have Agatana get arrested. So a squad of soldiers was ordered from the garrison, which was near Fort, Henry, uh, Fort York today. Um, and they came to Parliament House and picked up Moody Farewell and Elizabeth Lockwood and the High Constable of Home District and took them over to Gibraltar Point. Chief Wabakishiko was there with his people. Um, Elizabeth Lockwood identified Akatanika as the person who had bragged about murdering John Sharp. The chief handed the young man over to the high constable. The Mississauga people were there looking on with what we could expect to be anger and fear, but they did not resist. And Akatanika was taken over to York. The prisoner was incarcerated in the home district jail, which we see here. This was on the west south, the south side of King Street, just a little west of, well, where St. James Cathedral is there in King Street in Toronto today. As the prisoner was being secured in jail, the authorities considered their dilemma. They worried that a murder trial held at York would inevitably mean the hanging of a Mississauga man right there in the home district jail, while all of his friends and family were camped right over there at Gibraltar Point. This was happening in an environment where for many years there had been alarms raised that the indigenous people of Upper Canada were ready to rise up and massacre the whites. English settlers still held a very exaggerated view of indigenous people at that time as being violent and volatile, although there'd been very little recorded evidence of that in previous years. It was simply conventional wisdom based on racial prejudice. On a more strategic level, the folks at Parliament House had to maintain a very delicate balance. On the one hand, <clears throat> they needed to have more settlers come into Upper Canada, if only to produce more strong young men to carry muskets to fight against the Americans the next time they attack. And at this point, they knew they were going to attack. It was simply a matter of when. At the same time, they needed to maintain the support of their indigenous allies in that fight with the Americans. As a result, in Kingston, schooners were loaded with supplies, food and clothing and cooking utensils and hunting equipment and tools, all sorts of stuff. And that was all sent across the lakes and delivered to the indigenous villages, all to maintain good relations with their indigenous allies. So for those in power, a small local event, like, like the murder of John Shop, would not be allowed to interfere with the broader strategy. But it was clear they needed to avoid having a murder trial at York. So the Chief Justice focused on a law. Okay, where was I? One thing was certain. So Chief Justice Alcock, he found a solution. He focused on a law that said, a murder trial must be held in the courthouse of the county town in the district where the crime took place. Now, this was a fairly simple law and usually easy to apply. But in this particular case, there was a problem. Before 1802, home district 
used to spread from west of York all the way to the Trent River. But then Newcastle District was created to the east and the border was here around present day Oshawa uh, at the lakeshore north across Lake Scugog. Now by 1804, the only, only the first two concessions had been surveyed in order to support new settlers coming in. So north of there, it could not technically and legally be determined which of the two districts contained the farewell trading post. And that was critical because the authorities did not want to have the trial of Agatanakut at York, the county town of home district. They much preferred it be held at Newcastle down here on Presque Point, which was the county town of Newcastle district. So the Chief Justice Alcock determined that a survey was in order to determine which of the two districts contained the farewell trading post. The survey was conducted by John Stegman, who was one of the most experienced deputy surveyors in Upper Canada at this time. And his report was very clear. He said the exact and positive situation of the House of Moody Farewell is seven miles eastward of the division line between the townships of Whitby and Darlington, that border between Home and Newcastle District. Well, Chief Justice Alcock would have been happy with this result because it meant that, in fact, the trial of Akatanakut would be held at Newcastle and not at York. So, mission accomplished. By the end of September, the only ship anchored in York Harbor was HMS Speedy. It was riding easily there at the west end of the bay off the garrison. Its captain, Lieutenant Thomas Paxton, was given orders to prepare the ship for up to 20 people and their baggage and to sail to Newcastle. Departure date was to be Sunday, October 7th. Captain Paxson was appalled at his orders. It was October, it was outside the safe sailing season on Lake Ontario. And besides, his ship was in bad shape after a very difficult season of storms and bad weather. How could he be responsible for that many souls under such conditions? Captain Paxson actually refused to sail. Well, Lieutenant Governor Hunter was not amused. He simply threatened Paxson with court martial if he refused an order. You know, sail to Newcastle or go to jail, that was his choice. And we might think that Captain Paxton probably had his wife and children in Kingston in mind when he relented and agreed to sail, but he certainly wouldn't be happy about it. HMS Speedy was a twin mast schooner about 55 feet long. At this time, it was about six years old, so very near the end of its expected lifespan. In fact, there was already a major repair and refit on the books at the Point Predict shipyard for HMS Speedy and its sister ship, HMS Swift, once they got back to Kingston at the end of the season. Ships built by the Pro Provincial Marine at this time were constructed of green, uncured pine timber. That meant that they rotted quickly, and every winter these ships needed to come into the Point Frederick shipyard to have a major refit just to get them back out on the uh, lake for the next season. On October 5th, Captain Paxson ordered his crew to raise the anchor and they sailed just a little bit east in the bay and dropped anchor again, about 200 yards off from Parliament House. This put them nearby what was called the landing place. This was just a gravelly stretch of beach that the folks in York found very convenient. They could bring their baggage down there and hire a young man in a Batoa rowboat to take them out to a ship that was anchored in the bay. Again, it's 1804. This is before any of the commercial wharfs or any of the dredging, any of the development happened along the shore. So it was a very natural shoreline at this point. Two days later, early in the morning of Sunday, October 7th, a squad of soldiers came from the garrison. They stopped at the home district jail, picked up Agatanaka, put him in the middle of their formation and marched him down King Street and down to the landing place. And a couple of soldiers took him over to the Speedy and fastened him with chains in the hold. Later that morning, the rest of the passengers began to arrive at the landing place and ferry over to the ship. The highest ranking individual to board the Speedy that day was Robert Isaac de Grey. He was the Solicitor General of Upper Canada. Now, single man, age 32, he was uh, accompanied by his personal servant, Simon Baker. Now, Simon was a member of a slave family that had been with the Greys for decades. In fact, before sailing on the Speedy, Robert Gray would write a will 
in which he stipulated that in the event of his death, all of his slaves would be freed. Gray was also accompanied by a legal assistant in the person of 20-year-old John Anderson, who was a law student at York and also happened to be his cousin. Also boarding the Speedy that day, Thomas Cochran. Now at age 27, he was very young to be a judge on the Court of King's Bench for Upper Canada, but he'd been appointed to preside at the trial of Akatanika. John Fisk was the High Constable of Home District and he would be responsible for the security and condition of the prisoner. James Ruggles was a magistrate and justice of the peace at York and he would travel in support of John Fisk. Angus McDonnell was a lawyer and he had been appointed as counsel for the defense in the trial. Of course, John Stegman, the deputy surveyor was on board. He expected to testify at the trial. And George Cowan was an agent of the Indian department and he was one of the most experienced interpreters in Upper Canada at this time. The passenger list was rounded out by Jacob Herkimer, a merchant and trader. And he was expecting to testify at the trial as part owner of the Farewell Trading Post. And of course, Lieutenant Thomas Paxson, the captain of the Speedy, who had been barking out orders to half a dozen crew members. And again, there were two soldiers on board guarding Augatonica. We believe there were about 20 people on the Speedy that day. There is a report that the Speedy ran aground before getting out of York Harbor. Now, there was no damage, and Captain Paxson was able to disembark a couple of hours later. But this delay would have serious consequences. It usually took about 24 hours, a little over 24 hours to sail from York to Newcastle. But now with this delay, the Speedy wouldn't arrive at Newcastle until late in the afternoon and into the evening in darkness. Well, Captain Paxton may have grumbled at his misfortune, but he ordered the crew to take the Speedy out. They sailed about a mile offshore, which was common practice in those days. The weather held through the night and they sailed with a light westerly breeze. Then. During the morning of Monday, October 8th, the wind picked up and the sky filled with clouds. By afternoon, the Speedy was being pushed by a strong westerly storm towards Newcastle. And by late in the afternoon, the rain began to come down and passengers would huddle under blankets and furs as best they could. And Captain Paxton began to worry. During the evening of Monday, October 8th, the Speedy was getting closer to Newcastle, pushed by a strong westerly storm. Then, sometime during the evening, a nor'easter hit the area. We know this kind of storm in the fall comes out of northern Quebec and blasts down across the Great Lakes in a northeast to southwest direction. This was a vicious storm. It brought very low temperature and very high winds, and it lasted for two days the Speedy was not seen again. After the storm passed, the people at Newcastle spent several days scouring the shoreline in every direction, looking for just a sign of the Speedy. Not so much as a stick of wood or a piece of clothing was found, nothing. On October 15th, a letter from Kingston to York said, the Speedy's non-arrival prevents my sending the pay list for Ryerson to sign. This was eight days after the Speedy had set sail. Now it's a practical and mundane matter, but it does indicate that the people of Kingston were concerned that the Speedy had not arrived as expected. Then on the 19th, Lieutenant Colonel John Vinson, who was commander at Fort George, the military base here at the mouth of the Niagara River, wrote a letter to York reporting that items from a ship had been found about 40 miles east of Fort George near a place called Oak Orchard Creek on the US shore. Six days later on the 25th, a second and confirming letter arrived at York to leave no doubt. And it included the final evidence saying the name of Paxton was on the lantern of the binnacle. This confirmed what everyone feared. HMS Speedy had in fact been destroyed by that vicious storm on the 8th and there was no hope for the 20 souls on board. This was the only contemporary report of any physical remains of HMS Speedy being found. Now let's fast forward to the modern age. This is 
Ed Burt. Ed grew up in Belleville. He loved diving from an early age. He gained an engineering degree at Carleton University in Ottawa. And he created two enterprises. First was a, a metal foundry, which specialized in marine products. And then an underwater salvage and exploration company called Ocean Scan Systems. Ed developed a lot of expertise and the tools of his trade, including this very popular sea otter, um, underwater remotely operated video camera. Jobs that Ocean Scan Systems undertook were varied, but they included things like finding a small aircraft that had crashed in a Northern Ontario lake, or occasionally the dirty work of removing bodies from submerged vehicles. They often worked with the law enforcement agencies, the RCMP, OPP, and Coast Guard. They often trained OPP divers. There was no lack of demand for this kind of expertise. In the summer of 1989, Edbert and his crew were conducting training sessions for OPP divers in Lake Ontario, southeast of Presqu'ile Point. They were operating over the shallowest point in a large underwater plateau that was called Dobbs Bank. Suddenly a diver came out of the, from the water and handed Ed a coin that he had found on the ground under the water. Now Ed quickly identified the coin as a very old vintage. It had the date 1732 very clearly on one side and most of the writing was in Spanish. In fact, this was a piece of eight and Ed was very intrigued by this find. It's fine to say the least. Only a few weeks later, Ed and his crew were again out on Dobbs Bank, but this time they were testing a new model of remotely operated underwater camera. They would run the camera in the water, would take pictures of the ground and the images would be sent through a cable to a computer in the boat. And then it would be stored in a VHS tape. That night, Ed took the VHS tape home and reviewed it just out of curiosity. Well, he was amazed at what he saw. He felt that he was seeing in these pictures under the water on the ground, items that looked to be from a very old shipwreck. Now the resolution of the tape is low and visibility in the water is very poor in many places, but he still thought he saw enough to warrant investigation. Certainly the video and the coin within a few weeks set Ed Berth on a, on a path towards exploration. This image you see here is the introductory screen of a promotional video tape that Ed created that included that 1989 testing video. Uh, a copy of that VHS tape was included in the box of documents that I received in the fall of 2018. And I have been since able to uh, convert that material into digital format for easier handling. Well, in order to get started with the project, Ed contacted a professional marine archeologist he knew and showed him the video. Well, the archeologist said, yes, there's enough here to warrant investigation. So the archeologist arranged for an archeology span survey license for the site for that year. He also arranged for what they call protective measures, which is really just boys at the corners of the big area they were searching to tell people not to come in. It also created the HMS Speedy Foundation, a nonprofit corporation that was used to promote the project and to do fundraising. Well, initially bad weather kept them off the lake. They didn't get started with survey work until June 16th. Then they began to follow the grid system that had been set out by the archeologists. Now that video from the year before had no location information with it. And this was a huge area. So, it would be a matter of eliminating one grid square after another until they found what they were looking for. This picture is from July 26. It shows Glen Rover, the boat that was used for survey work in the 1990 season. And there's Ed sitting on Avon, the inflatable raft that was used uh, as a diving platform. Chief diver in Ed's crew was Terry Coons, shown here with a scorching sunburn. Uh, Terry is a very experienced diver. Uh, gained much of his training from the U.S. Navy. Terry talked to me at length about his work with Ed's crew and the Speedy Project. He said that first year in 1990, there was beautiful weather for several weeks in a row at the end of July into August. He said he lost 50 pounds from constant diving. 
Well, the practice was they'd run the, the video camera uh, through the water and they'd watch the image come up to the monitor in the boat. They saw something interesting, they'd stop and have the diver go down and take a 35 millimeter underwater camera and um, take pictures. So in a, in a really nice day, you could do that a dozen times a day and it was hard work for the diver. Well, through the diving season of 1990, the survey work continued, but they failed to locate any of the items from the 1989 video. Then right at the end of the season in the middle of October, they hit the mother load. They moved to the next grid square and very quickly started to see items scattered around. Ed identified some items from the 1989 video. So the last two diving days of that season were spent simply documenting all of the items that they were finding. There was great elation at the crew after a seemingly unproductive season of hard work. In hindsight, Ed would grumble that they were on the adjoining square back in July and they just didn't know how close they were. Well, that's just part of the vagaries of underwater exploration, I guess. Here's an important point. The archeological survey license for the Speedy site for 1990 was applied for and given to a professional marine archeologist. As a result, the pertinent clause in that license read, the licensee agrees to retrieve only a limited number of artifacts sufficient to establishing full and proper identification of the wreck. Well, that's fine and dandy, but they didn't find any artifacts until the very end of the season, then only had time to document them. So even though this was in effect for that first year, they had no opportunity to take advantage of it. Then in the spring of 1991, the professional marine archeologist decided not to return to the Speedy project. He said he just had seen no evidence that this was the Speedy they were dealing with. Yes, they'd found things at the end of the season, so they should continue. And if they found something that might identify the wreck as the Speedy, he'd be glad to come back and help. But in the meantime, he had other major projects to work on. As a result, the survey license for the 1991 season was applied for and given to Ed Burt, who was not a professional marine archeologist. And as a result, the pertinent clause in the 1991 license read, retrieval of artifacts from underwater sites is not covered under this license. In effect, now they'd actually found items the season before, they could not now bring them up to try to identify the wreck. Subsequent licenses, we begin to use terms like do not disturb, which meant total hands off everything they found. Well, this situation was very annoying for Ed Burt. Now they'd actually found artifacts. He wasn't able to bring them up to try to identify the wreck. And if he couldn't even begin to identify the wreck of the Speedy, then the professional marine archeologists weren't gonna be interested in participating in the project. And if the professionals weren't engaged in the project, it was less likely they'd be able to identify the wreck as the Speedy. It was a classic catch 22 situation. So what did they find? They found a debris field. No, it's not a sunken ship like, you know, we see in National Geographic and recreational diver magazines. It's a very large debris field, three or four square kilometers with many items scattered around often in clusters. This image from the 1989 video generated a lot of buzz in the archeology span community early in the project. We can see here a pair of spectacles, a clay pipe, a cannonball, and one of those long square black glass bottles with the cork still in place. Terry Coons as the chief diver stood over this scene several times, was amazed at it, but he said the archeologists were interested because even this foggy picture, with this foggy picture, they were able to tentatively date these items to the very early 1800s, which meant an unusually old shipwreck in Lake Ontario. Some of the most easily identified items were the masts. Speedy was a twin mast schooner. Now the divers initially thought these were just logs, but when they looked closer, they saw, well, there were two of them, they were lying close together and they were identical. And on closer examination, they saw, well, they're manufactured for sure. Look at the tapered end. 
The dimensions and specifications of these masts match very well with documents we have from the Point Frederick shipyard for schooners built by the Provincial Marine in the late 1790s. Speedy was a gunboat, so it would have cannon and cannonballs on board. Here's on the left here, one of many different cannonballs that were identified in the debris field. And on the right is a foggy picture of a small cannon. This is called a carronade. And it's typical of the kind of small cannon that would be installed on small British gunboats in that era. Terry Coon stood over this and he said what he was most interested in was this round raised area here on the top. He said it was like a crest. He thought there might be identifying information there. But do not disturb was in place. So he didn't scrape the moss off the crest. Terry Coons also stood over the ship's bell or what he thought might be the ship's bell. He said, once you got close to it, it was very evidently a ship's bell. It was lying on its side beside some rocks. It was covered in very thick moss. Terry Coons told me that at one time he stood here and he thought, oh, it would be really a quick job for me to pull out my knife and scrape the moss off the bell and see if the name HMS Speedy is written across the bell. Now, I, we can't say if it was the habit to put the name of the ship on the bell at that time, it would be later. But in any case, it's a fascinating idea. However, Terry Coons knew very well that if word of that kind of activity got back to the Ontario Provincial Ministry that manages marine uh, archaeology licenses, that Ed's license would be in jeopardy and the whole speedy project. So he didn't scrape the moss off the bell. After three seasons of diving on the speedy site, at the end of the 1992 diving season, funding ran out and Ed Bird had to get back to revenue generating work. In fact, for Ed, the Speedy project had been a money pit. Well, in subsequent years, Ed followed a persistent promotional program, um, trying to raise awareness of his work in the community. Um, he focused on uh, corporations and government institutions that might fund further activity on the Speedy site. He used the HMS PD Foundation to promote the project. It had newspaper articles and speaking engagements, did things like t-shirts and this crest you see here. Ed also developed the idea that a marine museum should be built and his preference was right there on Presque Hill Point to house all these artifacts that should be brought up from the Speedy site. Unfortunately, nobody was interested in a marine museum, especially not at Presque Hill Point. And the growing regulations from the Ontario Ministry that manages underwater archaeology would just never allow anything like that to happen. In spite of all that, Ed persisted in promoting that idea. Ed also continually applied for survey licenses for the Speedy site long after there was no survey work being done at the end of 1992 season. It was also no secret that Ed Burt hated doing reports to the ministry. So it was no surprise for me to find out in my research but that by in the early 2005, he was so far behind in his annual reporting requirements that the ministry finally put their foot down and said, you will get no new licenses unless you at least make an attempt to bring your reporting into compliance. So in order to get new licenses, Ed was compelled to complete the HMS PD project report for 1997. Again, it's 2005, no survey work since 1992. In his own contrarian way, Ed Burt would use this opportunity to provide a full-throated version of what he believed had happened to the Speedy. He'd been leading up to this for a long time, and it all came cascading out in the 1997 project report. 120 pages, some of it filled with very complex technical detail about this issue or that factor that might have entered into the route that the Speedy took or the nature of its demise. He used all of his charts and maps and pictures to support his ideas. It was really quite a production. The most important page of the 1997 project report was this nautical chart that Ed created to show the estimated route of the Speedy highlighted in the dark blue line. As he told the story in the 1997 project report, Speedy was sailing from the west 
pushed by a strong westerly storm and at night. Captain Paxson could not make the turn into Presque Isle Bay. And the Speedy was blown off to the east into Weller's Bay. Now, in 1804, there was not nearly the sand spits blocking Weller's Bay that we know of today. So it would have been a natural thing to go into the bay. And Captain Paxson would have been happy to ride out the storm there. And a couple of days later, once the storm passed to sail over into Presque Isle Bay, it would have been kind of normal habit for him. However, his luck ran out because this is when the nor'easter hit the area. And the nor'easter blew the Speedy back out into Lake Ontario. The dramatic climax of the story comes when the Speedy collides with a large rock a few inches below the surface of the water right there on that shallowest point of Dobbs Bank. This was a violent collision. The, the hull cracked like an egg, the decking split apart in seconds. And the mass toppled over and along with all the people and the baggage, everything ended up in the raging lake waters. 20 people on board would have died either in the collision or very soon as the ship disintegrated around them. Then, as that nor'easter continued to howl from a northeast to southwest, south, <laughs> a northeast to southwest direction, every item from that ship sank down into the water and gradually eventually found a resting place over Dobbs Bank. This is what Ed Burt believed had happened to the Speedy. He believed it in 2005 when he wrote this report and he would believe it to the day he died in 2017. Of course, some of the information in the 1997 project report, we must call speculation. Look, Ed Burt was an engineer and he knew what he had seen on the ground over Dobbs Bank during his survey work. And he believed that he needed to provide a dramatic and compelling story that would explain how every piece of the ship could end up in that location and in that condition as he saw it during his survey work. We might call it reverse engineering. In 2012, Ed Burt refreshed the membership in his HMS Speedy Foundation, and that's when I joined as a historian in Brighton. I went on to learn more about the story and what better way than talk to directly to the guy who did the diving. Uh, we did meetings and did some promotional programs. We often did speaking engagements. Sometimes we went independently, sometimes we went together, such as this Probus Club meeting in Brighton in 2014. One of the most enjoyable projects we undertook was this storyboard that was installed on the west wall of the Interpretive Center in Pre uh, Presque Isle Provincial Park. I provided the content. Uh, Phil Spencer is another member of the group, built the frame and we installed it together. We had good support from the friends of Presque Isle Provincial Park who operate the Interpretive Center. Of course, this is in, in addition to the dramatic video that's been there in the little theater in the Interpretive Center for a number of years. And of course, the historical plaque that's over by the shore. So the story of HMS Speedy is well represented in Presque Isle Provincial Park. In spite of all of this, the mystery remains. Are those artifacts that Ed Burt saw over Dobbs Bank during his survey work actually remains of HMS Speedy? The right answer today is we don't know. Now, Ed Burt's work would appear to provide information to suggest that it's possible. Of course, Ed Burt would always tell us that he was 99.99% .99 sure he found the remains of the Speedy. He believed that till the day that he died. Bottom line, these artifacts require the direct attention of professional marine archaeologists. The professionals must come in a boat over Dobbs Bank, bring all their latest fancy equipment, the sonar and underwater remotely operated video cameras and all. Imagine how much better the technology is today than it was in the early 1990s. They also must use the documentation that Ed created and try to find those artifacts again. Without the direct engagement, of the professionals, the mystery will remain. Question, does it matter? 
Well, I can tell you as a historian, it does not matter a lot to me. Sure, it would be great to eliminate the mystery. You know, add another little piece to the grand mosaic of Canadian history. I'd be one of the happiest people around if that could be accomplished. However, the story, the, the fact remains, the story of HMS Speedy is a rich and fascinating part of Canadian history. And without pieces of metal and wood in the museum, it's part of our heritage. And that's good enough for me. So in the meantime, we'll continue to tell the story and learn what we can from it. That's the story of HMS Speedy, folks. Um, I hope you enjoy the book, The Wreck of HMS Speedy, The Tragedy That Shook Upper Canada. It's widely available in the bookstores. Uh, Indigo loved this book from the beginning. It's kind of been uh, a bit of a damper on it with the pandemic and everything, but it's available also in your libraries and as an ebook. There's no audio book yet. If you're interested in a little more information about my books and my history work, please have a look at my website, danbuchananhistoryguy.com. And I will highlight two things there that you might be interested in. I have created a full video series on the same lines as the book. And of course, you know, in video, you can use a lot more pictures. So for those who like a video, uh, please go to my website. They're on YouTube as well. There's also a section there called Extra Info. And I like to say this is, this is for the history geeks. Um, this is some downloadable PDF files that I've provided that contain detailed research about certain issues peripheral to the story, stuff that didn't make it into the book. So feel free to help yourself to that if you're interested. Well, that's a speedy story. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have. So thanks very much for your attention.